Inscription is a game that was recommended to me by a student. I told them I was working on an Amori video and they said this one might also be my jam. So I've gone into this with no expectations, no idea what this game is. Having a look at it, Inscription is a game I think fundamentally about loneliness and the importance of games in connecting us and perhaps even about a predatory game development industry. Now, you might disagree with my conclusions here, but my goal is to philosophically engage with the game, much in the same way that I did with my Doki Doki video. This isn't so much about reacting to a game, but reflecting on it. You'll never see Markiplier thinking about a game too much. Going in blind, each of these are my actual thoughts, feelings, impressions, and questions as I went through. I wrote these one session at a time and built on them. People say philosophy is about answering the big questions of life, the universe, and everything, but that's just not true. Being a philosopher is about coming up with questions, and then exploring them more and more precisely. So be prepared in this video for many frustrating questions and Yu-Gi-Oh references. This opening to a game, I have to say, is actually really something. I can't start a new game, only continue. There's a table, and there's a person's eyes opening there in the dark. A board is laid out. It tells me how to do it. This is a tutorial. The cards are unusually expressive. It's teaching me how to play the basic mechanics. There's attack power, defense power, life points, uh, sacrifices needed, basic Yu-Gi-Oh rules. I can't get over how creepy this opponent is though. It's just eyes there in the dark. It doesn't look like a person. The hands, the hands are leathery. Every time it speaks, the eyes go crazy. Like the mere act of human speech causes madness within it. All right, so I've got this start and I'm using it. And okay, yeah, that makes perfect sense. I dealt one da damage, that's fine, but Wait, what? The animal objected to the sacrifice? What the hell? I didn't get to read the whole thing. It said like it didn't want to die or, or something. There's a, a roguelike element to this game. Procedurally generated, it looks like, combined with a tabletop RPG presentation. Now, this is really weird because the stoat is talking to me. I kind of don't want to sacrifice him again. He's Weirdly accepting though, despite the antagonism, he, he looks super mad. <laughs> okay, the game is teaching me about other abilities. There's more than attack points, some of them can do other things, they can evolve, some can fly over other mon monsters. I think I'm 11 minutes in, and I think I'm getting a handle on this. Okay, not only can I sacrifice monsters each round, but I can do it on an altar in-game, and that would permanently imbue creatures with the power of other creatures. Tell you what, I did not- like, the stoat wanted me to empower him, and I did not like his face when I did that. He wanted empowerment, but was also sarcastic about it? Does he- does he not care about this? I have to say, this game as it is right now, this particular match, is not going well for me. And the stoat is not just expressing preferences about its play, but about the game master itself directly. And the game master is speaking to the stoat. What is going on here? Oh shit, I lost. Okay. Well, he's let me get up. And... Oh god. It's just eyes there in the dark. I can't make out what this thing is. And why is there flashing behind the door? Where am I? Where, what is going on here? This thing is its really unnerving. This is actually evocative of, uh, of like those old school um, panel games where you, you walk through in an adventure and it didn't have any actual movement in it. It's just blank screens like uh sorry it's it's like um 
a flat panel in the way that they did for, for Mist. Alright, so, it's given me the opportunity to make only two mistakes, and, and then it's going to sacrifice me? W sacrifice how? To whom? To, to what? Alright, I like this cat. I, I think he's going to be my MVP, so I'm going to make him evolve into a Persian or something. The stoat is saying that I can leave. And I'm in a foul cabin. Am I in the woods or something? He's also giving me advice on how to play. Oh, 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 yeah, okay, I, I, maybe that was a bad spot. I'm I'm in trouble now. I, I can't draw blood from a tree. Well, okay, now that seems obvious to me, and I'm, I think I'm rooted. What happens next? Ah, uh, okay, okay, not cool. Not... <laughs> Uh, this is... Uh, yeah, okay, it can seem weird now in the dark. Uh, I'm, I'm definitely gonna die. Death card. What's a death card? Well, at least this card is gonna be pretty good. You do not need to smile might be the creepiest thing I've ever heard, and my mom once tried to convince me to find a girlfriend at a family reunion. Thinking on all this so far, I think the stoat might be a victim too, but it talks... Will my death card speak to me? He... I am... Alive, I guess, or remembered? But... And I'm now in the game as a previous victim. The stoat is a victim too, but he's not like this. My card doesn't talk, it's just there. It's... Mm. It's so unsettling sitting, sitting in this cabin with whatever this creature is. I'm now another person, not the same person. I think I'm going to... I get to get up again, look around. There's a safe, some kind of object find minigame, and... Yep, don't like that at all. <laughs> oh, the stoat is saying that there's more victims around. I just... I don't trust him. It's it's helping me, but I don't see it because he cares. He's using me. Oh, dude, I'm a card in the game now. That's... Okay, I'm gonna have to look up new synonyms for creepy. E eerie? Does eerie... Ghoulish. Oh, sinister. Yes, it's sinister. Alright, I'm gonna unlock the safe with a password from the stoat in the book, and it has... a new talking card and a key. There's a, a logic puzzle here based on deductive reasoning. I'll be honest, I don't quite understand how this works. I don't what, know what these numbers mean or these symbols. I'll have to come back to it later. This whole thing feels like I'm a, in a serial killer's house, but it's like my brother became unhinged and his tabletop gaming is now psychotic. The bug and the stoat are talking to each other, so they're both victims and the stoat is an absolute jerk. The, the bug is more friendly, but... What are these things? They're not death cards, there's something else entirely. The, the vibe of this whole game is macabre and cruel, there's no kindness in this game, it's, it's bloody and callous. These campfires about power-ups are just... unsettling again. Something just odd happened, it was like I was watching the area around the fireplace and it seemed to pixelate for a moment, like an interface screw? Like, I'm watching a computer screen, or a VHS. And- oh, boss time! Okay, and it is- ah, ah, Okay, how is- how is having that mask on worse than nothing? Oof. Okay. I lost memory in the flash, the camera. What- what is the camera? What does it do? What's its power? Because... If... I'm... dead... My characters don't call talk, but the stoat was captured, but they're not dead? Oh, what if it captures my soul and those, and then he kills me? Alright, anyway, doesn't matter. I beat the boss, time for a rare card and round two. Win some battles, get up. Still don't know how this puzzle works. And boss two, it's the angler. It's something, 
it's Lovecraftian. It's the Innsmouth look. Huge, bloated faces, hostile eyes, you know, racist undertones. Okay, I've made a terrible choice putting myself down there on the board, and I think I'm in trouble. But no, okay, I'm in serious trouble, and oh god, those hands. Ugh. I lost properly. Now I've got an opportunity to steal his camera and... Hey! Wait, no, wait, no, no, there's no hope. Okay, I died a second time. I think I'm gonna name this one after my wife. At the end of this first session, it's too early for me to have any coherent thoughts about this. The gameplay is pretty fun, and I'm digging the horror vibe of a collectible card game, um, but there's a lot going on in the background here, and even after what's ostensibly an entire hour of play, I have no idea what's ha what, what's happening here in a wider context. It feels like a creepy pasta. I'm supposed to go looking for things. There's a green goo man in a jar and I'm being taunted or provoked into finding them. Look, this is a little bit embarrassing for me to admit, but I still don't know how to solve this puzzle. I got frustrated by it and I simply brute forced it by trial and error. I think it has something to do with the combat in miniature and getting an even result. It's, it's not clear to me. Dying is not a good outcome, but it is part of the game. It's the only way to learn. There seems to be an infinite number of times I can cut Damn it! F you. <laughs> There's something surreal about unfurling a booster pack of cards, and one of the options is me, and then Jasmine, and my failures are built into the game as ways of becoming stronger, having better cards, and I myself am one of them. I haven't created the best card here in my death card, but it is definitely better than the others that I get. And I've lost again, and. Wait, what is... this is new? What is... who is that? Alright, well, this is a pretty obvious clue that I need to cut up the caged wolf. There was a really clear hint, though, that other things were going on. Someone spoke. My character. Me. Okay, that was me. But through a monitor? This... I really think that I am playing someone playing a game. Jesus Christ, I just gouged out an eye. There is a, a monstrous lack of bodily integrity here. Do you ever think much about bodily autonomy and integrity? Human cognitive processes are actually really strange when you think about them. We have very clear perceptions about what is me and what is not me. There are things that you can, that are connected to us, right? Body parts, blood, saliva, hair, and then there are things that are not. You can take your glasses on and off and feel no change to your bodily autonomy, even if you have profoundly poor eyesight. But imagine spitting into a cup. That saliva is no longer part of you. Like, imagine trying to drink it again. It's detached, threatening, disgusting, or trying to reconsume your own blood or urine. It's pretty, pretty gross, right? There's an obvious horror in losing an eyeball or a tooth. You permanently lose something, that you need for basic functioning, to, to see, or to chew. The horror here, I think, is how readily the character is willing to dismember themselves, and then to replace those lost parts with more parts. You ever watch Naruto and characters just swap eyeballs like they're pairs of clothes? Like, like they're willing to do this to themselves, and it's in that willingness that it becomes horrifying? It's not that separating our limbs or organs is horrifying, that's bad to be sure, but it's the re-engagement with those lost limbs that makes it profane. This is a little bit out of my knowledge, but in feminist, femino in feminist phenomenology, there's some pretty brilliant stuff about the sacred and the profane, and how, you know, regular bleeding from women is seen as taboo because of this fungible uh, experience with bodily integrity. I'll see if I can find some good readings to leave in the description about this, but it is fascinating about um, how we see our bodies and our attachment to them. 
In any case, the solution to this whole trap itself is pretty obvious. I take the soul stealing camera and steal the guy's soul. I have no idea how to do this though. Um, my problem is, honestly, it's my own attention to detail. The numbers on the cards are easy enough to deal with because, you know, uh, they're, you know, numbers, maths, right? But I'm not paying attention to these sigils. I didn't realize that I can't sacrifice a caged wolf or that I need to bones to summon certain creatures. These small details like sigils convey big differences every single round. I lost this round here simply because I wasn't paying attention to them. I think I also need to be choosier about my attack patterns and unit placement. I've been playing a game like Yu-Gi-Oh for like since it started like 25 years ago whenever it was and there is very little requirement that you place cards carefully. In this game, placement is essential for victory. This is a game about learning through failure and I failed enough times now to realize that I need to pay attention. And oh God, every time I have to watch this nightmare game over screen. Okay, this guy is now the main boss and I'm approaching through the woods, which... Oh man, it's, it's like switched to a different mode and into the cabin and... Oh, oh, uh, nope, 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 what the hell? Uh, what is this guy? He's not human. What is he even doing here? A crazed humanoid... What, like a lesion? With a bunch of eternally enslaved souls and a magic camera, not to mention that this guy is a total bitch. Steal the moon so that I can't win? Oh, okay, honestly, that's that's pretty clever. It, was, it reminds me of the ending of Portal 2, where you win by uh, sucking Wheatley out into space. <laughs> I've got you now. I'm gonna I'm gonna capture you. Oh, god, that was that just. It's such a tiny animation, and it's so unnerving, and... Okay, I'm... I'm trapped in this room now. With all of these bodies of its previous victims. Awesome. I've watched the flickering light from outside this room, but there's nothing I can do. I'm just trapped in here. Alright, I'm gonna... Oh, there's a new... The new game button is active? No, I want to. I want to continue. I want to. No, it's just, it's just trapped in here, alone. Nothing to do. Nothing to see. No light. Have I been the one in there the whole time? Is this a temporal issue? I don't know. When my session restarted, it's a bunch of found footage with a guy called <sighs> Luke. Okay, yeah, that's that's awesome. Uh, and he's super into card games, and he's saying that he's playing Inscription, and it's a basic collectible card game. This is this is actually kind of what I expected once I started playing the game originally. I'll I'll, I'll be honest though, guys, I accidentally left they found footage area of the game and then went on because I wanted to see what was next and I thought I could come back. So I've missed a whole bunch of the initial found footage, but it does look like this guy is a, I don't know, like a, a YouTuber doing card openings. Can't tell past this point. Anyway, this, the whole game has switched to like a eight bit era, uh, Nintendo game. The characters I've encountered them before. They're just like little NPCs and, I'm still playing the same card game, but it's just nowhere near as compelling without that 3D presentation. Or maybe it's just the better card art? Probably the art, actually. Back when I was a teenager, I used to play Yu-Gi-Oh! on Game Boy emulators, and they were all just like this potato quality that didn't match the regular rule set. It just scratched this itch that I had whenever I couldn't play the, you know, the, the real life version. This is, this is not a game about replacing the scribes, it's about Luke playing the game and becoming unhinged as the game involves him more and more, like he's personally affected by this thing. As I progress through this mode, I'm starting to understand better now that these scribes were part of the process before. The, the music is so unnerving though, they're, they're all... I, 
think that they might have been in the environment before, like the Goo Man, but I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to put the dots together here, but there's still not enough information. I'm, I'm talking to these guys and there are these like little split seconds of text and it's just a flash at the edge of my consciousness about them screaming in protest. They, they don't want to obey. There's just, I think there must be another level on top of this or beneath this or multiple layers beneath this. And the one that I started on before, the 3D one is just like the top layer, the surface level stuff. And each layer we peel it back going down from the skin to the bone, to the, you know, to the tissues, to the organs, and then to the skeleton. All right, I managed to make it through another area of the game I mean, like, it was basically playing Inscription until I get to this point, but there's more found footage. So it's definitely about a card reviewer, and he has encountered a digital version of this game. Like, the idea that it was originally just a collectible card game in real life, and now it's a video game. And it's telling a story about um, him contacting the game developer of this game, Funa, and then getting threatened with legal action. And then a woman comes to the door and physically intimidates him. Listen, uh, how'd you know where I live, exactly? My boss gave me your address. And how did you get past the side gate? It's locked. So, the game is now four times the scope of the original one. The, the Leshy, the guy who had me trapped, has... Or is it four times the size? Maybe it's the same size and the presentation is just different. I could be wrong. But the Leshy here... He's almost benign in this version. He's just chilling in the woods with a few of his for a few of his mates. Then there's the robots, and they also have three three friends. This feels very similar to the 3D version, just not in the sense of the card game or the characters, but in the sense of wrongness that I get here. No one should be here. This is like being trapped in the cabin, except now I'm trapped in a, a eight bit space. There must be another genre shift coming. I'm just... I'm in this perpetual discomfort. It's taking me way too long to figure out these clues. You know, like the skull, hand, wind. There's an element here of using every last thing on the screen and testing out what is possible and what is needed to gain clues to find it out. So, on the one hand, I kind of like the idea that I need to evaluate every last clue that I get in order to figure out what the solution is. On the other hand, I, I, it's embarrassing, but... I'm just brute forcing solutions to problems. This is like ineffective problem solving. Oh, what the fuck? It's a head on a spike and they're alive? There's a very common thread here that every last person uh, you encounter that's not one of the people at the top, one of these uh, scribes, it, their acolytes are being abused and their work is not being recognized or they're being gaslit. I mean, the wizard popped his eye to be blurry and buzzy, just like the main villain. Is it all interwoven? Are they the same person? Is it just a chimera of villains and vices? Hi, who am I supposed to be aware of? There's a greater scope villain here and it still isn't clear to me who that is. I just know that they're there and that Several of these characters are trying to prevent the bigger villain from emerging. Dude, okay, I just unleashed three evil characters when I defeated the Leshy. Alright, no, I'm gonna go and take them all on one by one. And I have managed, okay, like, I'm gonna just time skip here to where I've beaten all four villains, and I think that, okay, being in the cabin, being torn limb from limb, might actually not be the worst of all worlds. Like, it's that messed up. This robot has me tied up and forced to play another game. And it's barely even bothering to pretend. It's, it's interface screwed me into oblivion. Have I been in a simulation this whole time? Why am I special? Or I guess why is Luke special? God, I hate the pronouns in this game. I made it into the main room 
and the robot has me in the same situation as the Leshy. In, in some ways, it's, it's worse because of his cold disregard and lies. The, the Leshy was honest if um, psychotic or psychopathic. I mean, he didn't want to treat me like a prisoner. He, I don't know. I mean, like, would you rather have a serial killer threaten to murder you and be honest about it? and be warm and kind to you until they horribly killed you? Or would you rather that they lied to you the whole time, presenting you with false hope? There's no penalty for failure in this set of games, but this guy wants me to succeed, and he's torturing everyone around him, so something's going horribly wrong. And I keep meeting these, these characters, these minor ones, like this wizard boy, he was in the wizard's tower. He's... Oh, Luke is exclaiming now, my character. There was no interaction before, but there he is. I think he's been trained better here because there's less fear. Maybe he's just accl acclimated to the horror of it. I don't... I think that this guy, the robot, might be our greatest scope villain. But it's so hard when someone who is trying to convince you that they're on your side and they want you to succeed is using you and lying to you the whole time. Interesting note, I can't start a new game anymore. This guy, Luke, is... It's hard to talk about him because it's... I feel like I'm talking about myself in the third person. And it's just like my particular bad luck that we share a name. But it's it's starting to feel like a little bit more targeted to me. I know it's not. I know that, it, that that's just crazy talk. And that I'm inserting myself a little bit too much. But because the point of view character has my name. It constantly feels like it's directly talking to me. So there's new found footage. There's this person called Casey, and they're implied to be a character in the game, but she died in the 8-bit gameplay? I, I managed to freeze frame it, and it says, and there's this, this note here um, in the found footage that says, Mycologist, perhaps, blood letterbox. I have no idea what that means. Something to do with mushrooms and blood? I, eh, I don't know. Tell you what, going through found footage and and pausing it, I do feel like a flat earther. Like, oh, I'm, I'm going to analyze this thing and pull out what I can. And, and just like, the information here is borderline incoherent. Maybe it will mean something to me in future, but at the moment, it's, it's just garbage. I'm just going to leave it there as a potential clue on my conspiracy board. This game has access to my hard drive now. So that's, uh... <sighs> Select a file to add girth to this, to fight against things. Pick an old and important file. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. It'll, it'll, it'll be deleted? What the f***? Okay. <laughs> okay, P, PO3, the game master now, is far more invasive than the Leshy was. Now, honest, wait. He looks into my hard drive and threatens me personally. This is like tearing out an eyeball, except it's my computer files. Luke is the one in the game. This is an entry from his own diary. So yeah, okay, this has been well established at this point. Each character I've encountered keeps coming back though. They have acolytes and they have unwilling servants. The painter was one that I just beat. It's dredging up my Steam context now to make them enemies in the game. It's overwhelmingly involving me personally just to f with me and yeah of course it makes sense that the strongest one that i encounter would be my wife all these characters are so self-aware the sadness is palpable it's it's weird they, they were scary before they're just horrible to look at and staring at them like this fills me with deep unease but it's like they're not coping with reality. Or there's a there's a disaster that they're trying to prevent, but they know they won't. It's, I don't know, maudlin, I guess. These terrible monsters to have empathy with. 
And, okay, the disaster was me creating the game. It was all a trap. I knew it was a trap. I was springing the trap, but I didn't really have much option. PO3's hostility was pretty clear. I don't understand his motivation or his purpose, though. He's not a game dev. It's something else entirely. The other scribe stopped him, though. Just, just in time. Okay, but... The necromancer just deleted everything. It's all gonna go now. They aren't all convinced it was the right thing to do, but it's it's done. The necromancer wants to die. She's tired, but she enjoyed the game she got to play. She said that there's something evil at the core of the game. Something beneath the code. Okay, so... I think I was right before in the idea that this is layer upon layer, but there's something at the bottom of all these things that is... Eldritch. Abominable. <laughs> Again, it's really unnerving having the game refer to Luke. It's clearly about the character from the videos, but... You know, when it looks at my files, it's really off-putting, and, and my Steam list... And at the end of all of this, the necromancer just wants to shake my hand. Leshy gets another go, another game, and he wants to shake my hand too. Ooh, okay, the painter is a dual disc. Yes, okay. But his game is really unstable, and but ultimately he just wants to play and, you know, when it's all over, he just wants a moment to shake my hand as well. It's sad. Pathetic, in, in the truest sense of the word. Pitiable. So, what is at the end of all of this then? Footage of Luke destroying the disc? And then... I told you! <laughs> Murder. There are so many questions that I have unanswered. This is the end of the game. But... Who is Casey? Why do they keep referencing her? What happened to her? Who was the girl that murdered Luke and why did she do that? Were the bosses alive? They seem to be so real, like more so than, than something that was programmed in, because they could literally delete themselves. And what was the old code that they all referred to? The, the sinister warning I thought initially was about video footage, but it's about something else. I'm just left with so many questions and not a lot of information about this. And I, I don't want to simply go and look them up online. I want to, I want to discover it for myself. So I'm, I'm going to come back to it and see what I can come up with after thinking on it further. There was an extra game mode when I launched into the into it and it's called Casey's mod. It's just an additional way to go about it other than sort of restarting the whole game itself. I think I've begun to understand or maybe do understand what's going on here. It's the story of a cursed game. One where the characters are alive and magical or evil gods. I'm, I'm not sure. It, it ulti ultimately doesn't matter what the specific source of their power comes from. What matters is that they're a direct and present danger to the player character. What's going on in a more mundane sense, underneath the hood here, is the problem of crunch work culture at a game developer. Management has forced excess hours and poor working conditions on the developers, resulting in catastrophic levels of burnout, and they, they're turning on management. They're building in back doors to stop this from happening. I think that might be the illusions made with the workers, the, the the green goo guy, and these others who are all just, uh, they're doing the work in the game, but the scribes are the ones getting all the credit for it, as if they've done everything. I mean, the scribes are clearly important, but they're not the be-all and end-all of it all. I'm reading these log entries, and they refer to weird stuff. Most of them are about, uh, well, if it's Casey's mod, it's, it's Casey's diary, right? It must be. And she's outlining how much uh, 
it's difficult working here. They keep referring, she keeps referring to things like Karnoffel code, and they've alluded to this in the game. It's the supernatural corruption of the game's code. And I think it has to do with Nazi occultism and Hitler or Hitler's corpse somehow. That's the old data file. And it's the thing corrupting the designed game inscription. It's the thing that makes the game 3D and more than the basic 8-bit textures. The old data is power and corruption in a toxic sense. I spent the whole game with this dread and unease as I thought I was feeling it in myself. There's supernatural elements, serial killers, and things that I never fully came to understand about the way the game works. I didn't know what the Leshy wanted or what he was trying to achieve. Casey was a woman who was in some kind of friendship with the Leshy, one of the characters that they had created. And she let the occult evil of the disc survive rather than destroy him and the disc both. The last entry, this last entry here was written two weeks after I'd finished playing the game and Casey's mod. And my final thoughts are that the underlying story has to do with toxic work cultures and exploitation. Most companies are exploitative and dehumanizing. I mean, we tell ourselves that, you know, we've got ethical companies, but the simple fact of the matter is that there is a bottom line and companies are there to fulfill it. Everything else is secondary, which in a lot of cases is as good as saying humans don't really matter. Businesses create processes that turn humans into labor units. I have felt this way myself, even jobs that I enjoy, such as a teacher, as a lecturer, as, a, as someone who spends their time talking to young people. The pressures of organizations create unrealistic expectations because of power imbalances. I don't set policy, I just abide by them. Anytime that I've had authority over people, I do my best to minimize their suffering, to be human about this. But to live in a capitalist society is to be disempowered unless you're the owner. Power lies with those who make the rules, not the specialists, not the producer, not the worker. A manager or an owner doesn't create the game. Developers do. Designers and artists and coders do. But their ability to live is dependent on the owner who sets the terms of their lives. The background story in Inscription is one of alienation and disempowerment and isolation. Casey is desperate to feel some agency in her own life, but her corporate masters force her to work and become increasingly isolated. It doesn't matter to them. Why should any emotions matter to someone when there's a bottom line? She retreats into the game world, which is the only thing that she can do now to find connection. She engages with the seemingly real Leshy, who may or may not be real to her. Other workers at Game Funa are either in crunch mode 2 or in psychopaths, like the one who murders Luke at the end of the found footage. I really enjoyed Inscription. I was expecting a slightly terrifying psychological horror game, and in it was a surprisingly robust and interesting card game. Turns out I'm a sucker for card games. But underneath that gameplay is a surprising tale of existential isolation in a capitalist anxiety. It's not clear to me what the scribes are, whether they're de the devs, or the players, or the owners, or eldritch horrors, but in the end, most of them just wanted to play a game, to, to be social, to shake my hand, and to say good game. This really wasn't meant to be a massive digression into socialism and controlling the means of production. I mean, I could do that, but it, it really wasn't my intent starting out. It's just worth saying that when we do encounter these indecencies in the world, if we see people suffering because of our systems and unfair practices of, of inhumane treatment, we need to, to do more. We need to do better. We need to cut that out, consume less, and... and Try to remember that the other person at the end of this is also seeking connection. It's no good to end up a forgotten footnote in someone's game or a photo on a desk. We all deserve more than this token reminder of our existence. I wanted to thank you all for sticking around for this reflection. This one was 
Well, they're all actually much harder to write than the most because I do them piecemeal. They're, they're one chunk at a time. And often they're separated by about a day so that I have time to sit and reflect on each part to come to clearer conclusions. When we do it all in one big chunk, it's just a big muddled mess. And so by doing it this way, I come to greater conclusions by building on myself and my own thoughts and acknowledging that I have limited knowledge each time and developing it further, having the chance to feel, to understand what those feelings are um, and reflect on why I am feeling those ways. Now, you, you might have come to a different conclusion and that you might have engaged directly with the horror aspects of this game or simply not felt anything at all. But I ultimately came to feel that inscription, the horror elements there are about this continual dread and unease and anxiety we have for engaging, for consuming, and for producing. There's a way to do it well, and it's about connecting to each other, about, about like uh, shaking the hand and recognizing the personhood in the other person. This is a work of fiction to be sure, but my thoughts and feelings on the game and the way I experienced it, they're all real. They may differ from yours, but it's worth sharing these experiences with each other so that we can engage more with the personhood of others. By the way, if you ever did figure out what the old data was specifically, let me know. I think I remember reading something about Carnoffel Code, but I have no idea what it was. I think it was a whole occult, occult Nazi angle. I don't know. I might have missed it in my inability to solve some of these puzzles. I'm going to go back and play it a little bit longer, but um, and, and see if I can do the game in uh, Casey's mod on maximum difficulty, but uh, yeah. Thanks for watching, guys.